you're listening to the Curator Podcast, Season 2, Episode 8. An interview with Andrew Falkus from Future of the Left. So, this podcast was recorded just before Christmas, in fact, in November last year, believe it or not, and I was going to release it as my second episode, but there was a small issue in that the Skype recording software that I used basically garbled up or corrupted my side of the recording somehow, so I had to re-record my entire audio. So if you find any kind of weird glitches in this or if the audio halfway through sounds a bit different from it, how it should or how it did earlier on in the interview, then that's why. But I think this chat was totally worth the wait. So I hope you enjoy it. So what's the best way to, to talk to you? Is it Andy, Andrew, Falco? What's, what's the best What's the best mode of address? Well, my, my mother usually calls me Andrew, um, but not exclusively uh, she, she, I think she gets a little burn out of being called Mrs. Falco. <laughs> um, somebody actually took issue with my uh, nickname the other week in a pub, but he was from Yorkshire, so it doesn't count. <laughs> um, but yeah, just you know, my surname is Falcus, and some guy who made his living stealing guitars, I think, gave me the gave me the nickname about fifteen years ago. I, I fought it for about three years. Because it sounded ridiculous, and also there was um, uh, a game on a game on the Nintendo sixty four that had a character called Falco in it, who I didn't take <laughs> to immediately, but uh, but I, I accept it now. Um, Falco is fine. It, it makes me feel like more of a cartoon character, and thus I can answer in a more uninhibited way. Well, uh, that uh, that N sixty four game you're talking about it was a game called F Zero, and I fucking love that game, man. Yeah, it was like a. a yeah, it was like a split screen effort. I think it was for people who are looking for, um, you know, some multiplayer action which wasn't Golden Eye for five minutes. I think that was, I think that was the the long and the short of that. But uh, now it didn't really didn't really work for me at the time. I was pretending I was above video games during that period ah, of my life. I see, I see. It was, yeah, you know, it didn't last very long that period. But you know, we all we we all go through our little uh, our little trends. So I'll go, uh, first question, how are you doing today? How are things? Things are really good today. I had an incredibly unproductive day yesterday, almost to the point of self-parody, the procrastinating. So today has been exceptional. I've managed to uh, begin on one song, which I'm enjoying, and I've managed to wade my way through editing four chapters um, of the of the book I've written as well in an editing, in an editing kind of way. And... So I feel as if I've actually achieved something, which is a nice feeling. That means I can now nap with a with a happy conscience. So it's interesting you mentioned the book because one of the questions I have is that you have been pursuing writing over the past few years. I've I've seen on Twitter and so forth, and uh, I'm actually a writer myself, but I'm really interested in, in that. Um, how are you finding the editing process of editing your book? Um, sometimes uh, on certain chapters, incredible. As in, I'm, I'm really enjoying what I'm reading and enjoying the idea of making it better. And then at other times, painful because I'm really hating what I've written and want to stab myself in the balls. I think that's, <laughs> you know, it, it's very much, but like with the songwriting process, as I'm sure we'll get into in a bit, um, it's all a question of not getting too carried away with the good bits and not getting too depressed with the bad bits. Um, yeah, that's about it, really. And- an old, an old, uh, I'll say that again. An old philosopher, professor I had in uni, used to always say, "You've, you've got to kill the kids." Oh. If you write something that, that's, that's an, the most perfectly constructed sentence in the world, but it doesn't serve the story or it doesn't serve the narrative, then you just put that in a wee folder that says awesome lines that I've written. <laughs> yeah. get, rid of, get rid of that shit because you don't need it. <laughs> yeah, nice things, yeah. Lovel, lovely allusions, things which hark back to my childhood. And I, I had a, you know, I had a, a sentence today. Uh, describing a character in a particular way, and it was it was just right, but it it held up it held up the paragraphs, and it had to go. And it's it's sad, but sometimes you just got to say goodbye. I think there's a certain 
liberation to that ruthlessness once you don't just understand it in principle, but you put it in the practice. Yeah. Um, once you actually put that bit of purple prose behind you and what you're left with is stronger as a result, uh, there's that realisation that, oh, that, that absolutely is the right way to go. When you, as a, as a songwriter as well, I mean, your lyrics have always been very, I guess you could call, could say, I would say literate, but that means you can, that means you can write, which I guess everybody can do, but <laughs> quite, theory, at least, quite theory. literary, um, or like narrative almost, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Um, are you finding, how did, how have you found the kind of switch of focus towards writing as being a songwriter? Well, really difficult. I mean, I, I can't say it helped at all because the, the, the process of being a songwriter, like, like with any uh, discipline, not just artistic, the secret is just to do a fucking lot of yep. it. That's yeah. it. Um, if you want to write some good songs, start writing some songs and be prepared for the first one and a half thousand of them to be dog shit. And don't mind so much, even though at the time you'll enjoy them just fine. Um, it's kind of worked in reverse for me a little bit, as in the way I've had to formally look at writing over the last two years, prose. I wish there was a different word than prose. Prose just seems, it seems very particular, you know? It seems like I've just, you know, seems like I've just put on a cravat to say the word, word prose. There's something in, inherently pretentious about it. But learning how to do that has made me reflect upon how I've spent years writing songs and it, it's made me look on that process and notice the, the the formulas I was applying without even doing it consciously. And it's, it's helped improve and, for me, escalate the songwriting process. I always like to think of the way you write songs as an escalation, as if it's a, as if it's a bad thing, uh, because, because it usually is. I'm, <laughs> I'm the person who writes 12 songs and everybody goes, we got a record now. I'm like, but what about the new one I wrote when I was in the toilet? Um, and everybody has to immediately learn <laughs> the new the new bit of, bit of shit. But yeah, writing has has been very very interesting. It's been even if it doesn't end up leading anywhere, there's uh, it's it's an it's an experience um, to learn any. I mean, we all write, and I guess like yourself, like most people who are right, are people who are told from an early age by family or friends that they have a, an, an aptitude for it. And so you incline towards the areas that people say you're good in, you know? I mean, it was clear at a very early age I wasn't going to be a world-class gymnast. Um, so, But with, with writing, <laughs> I could always make people laugh when I was a child by virtue of especially my father making me read every day. Uh, I had a, you know, I had a reading age of 176 by the time I started school. Um, I, that would be a terrible thing, actually, because 176 would be, you'd, you'd have reversed into utter dementia. But um, it, I, I don't know, it's, it, writing, to compare it to making music is is really difficult. Making music, I mean, I can, some of the songs on the last album were written in the time it takes to, to sing them. And then I could immediately send a rough yeah. demo to somebody, ask what they think. I could have a reply in, in real time after they've listened to it. Instant validation as a human being. It doesn't work like that. I mean, you send a book to somebody and if you're lucky, they'll get back to you in two and a half weeks. Um, once they've made time to spend the, the 10 or 12 hours that they need to really give give to your best efforts so that's that's interesting learning learning patience i'm not a i'm patient when i'm crossing the road um and i'm patient in social situations but when it comes to uh when it comes to writing or finding out what people think about important issues or waiting for a company to reply to me because of an an error in an online clothing order I don't. I don't have a lot of patience. It must be said. So it's been it's been interesting to force myself to to learn that discipline. Well, that I'm wondering is um, given like the amount of creative output you've had over the past, well, I guess I guess your whole life you could say, and now been writing, 
Um, would you say? Would you call yourself like a, a sort of creatively restless person? Yes, yes, and no. I mean, it, it very much comes and goes, and you can, you know, a perception of restlessness is, you know, entirely indicative of the amount of time that a person has to spend on their, on their different, uh, you know, on their on their different loves. When, when I suppose I actually put a higher percentage of my available time into being creative when I was in my twenties and even two or three years ago when I was working full time jobs, um, and like with anything, people do tend to, in the same way that when people increase their income, they usually find a way to simply spend that income and get into more debt. They they grow into the amount that they earn. Uh, you you grow into time. And you think when you, I mean, I go through phases where I'm doing temporary jobs here. I'm not doing temporary jobs there. And before I start those jobs again, I always think, oh, I'm not going to have time to finish this project or this project. But you you make the time. You you simply you simply fit into to what you have. And I'm still aware as somebody who regards myself as creative and not nearly as lazy as most creative people that there is that uh, that there is that. There is that not even possibility, but likelihood of it happening. So when the laziness happens, you just need to be self-aware enough to allow yourself to to lie around like a fucking slob and then immediately kick your ass back into gear again. It's interesting you mention that because I think I think the perception of people that are creative is that they've got to wait for a particular moment and they ha- it's really difficult for them to find time to do it. Especially if you're doing. Yeah. If you're doing a job, um, like I guess most of us are, you know, but it, it always comes back to that. Well, you do have to make time. It's, it's got to be. It's got to be like a job almost. You've got to sit down and do that you, you, that day, you know. Absolutely. I mean, in you know, when the band uh, McCluskey, who I mean, a lot of people who would listen to your podcast wouldn't wouldn't have heard of. Uh, a lot of that band was the the normal way that bands, say, fifteen years ago, started. We'd uh, we all work jobs and we'd usually, I mean, the only shows we did at the time really were either in Cardiff, which is where we're based or in, in London, we'd go, we'd go back and forward and about three times a month, we'd be getting home at 4am and then up for work the next day at eight and straight, you know, straight back to the non-literal cool face. Um, uh, off, you know, sometimes having played to two people and having left, having left a, a, a town or a venue, I'm looking at Cambridge here with uh-huh. big glossy eyes, um, feeling as if w- what you were doing was not just worthless, but dangerous to your own self-esteem. Uh, or on the other side of the coin, coming from a position of uh, playing a show where where you feel like a, an undeserving hero and then six hours later you're stood in some hot room uh, photocopying uh, some really boring documents whilst a person with quarter of your intelligence patronises you. Um, and, you know, that can give you the emotional bends at times. Uh, you don't really know exactly where you are, but uh, you've got to have energy and you've got to have fortitude to get through that. There's a reason why people usually only do that for a couple of years before they give it up and get a degree in accountancy. It's because it, it it's a little bit exhausting. So compared, to, all I'm saying is compared to that situation, since I've had the time over the last couple of years, even though that that is probably coming to an end because of different financial pressures, like like everybody has, uh, I probably got more done relatively in that period. Um, but yeah, it's you really do have to you really do have to treat it as a job and. You know, sometimes, sometimes there is a there is an argument to say you really have to be to be feeling it to write it. But the best thing to do in that situation is simply to start writing and try and write yourself into it. And after I don't know an hour or so, if you still haven't lost yourself in the story, maybe it's time to step back. We have a similar attitude in rehearsals where if things are going well, I've learned enough about I think about my own artistic process to learn that when things are going well, just try and grab every moment of it. Take every advantage of the good feeling, whether it's yourself in a house or if you're in a band, a good feeling with you and the other 
human beings, your other friends in that room, try and get every, squeeze every ounce of fun and inspiration out of it. But similarly, when it's not going well, fuck it off and go to the beach you know whatever whatever your beach may be my my beach is a my beach is a late night run and then a peroni in the bath you know <laughs> sounds i do yeah yeah but you know for other people the beach might be crack cocaine and ironic appreciation of motley crew and if that's <laughs> if that's really what they're into then who am i to doubt them i've actually find i've been finding i actually do find it quite difficult to switch between like playing music in the band and and writing um, I feel as though I can't get. I have to be in a certain headspace, like in my life, to do both, which is sure. quite, yeah, quite disturbing for me because I've always been a writer. You know what I mean? So it's it's a weird, a weird kind of disconnect in my head. It it is weird, isn't it? But sometimes I'm guessing you can talk yourself out of that. Am I right? I you think, know, sometimes, I think we all can. Yeah, yeah, and that's 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 the thing. And sometimes, sometimes you simply just don't have the energy um, to to do that. I, yesterday I did nothing of worth. I was a waste of skin and air. But today I, you know, today I I didn't, uh, you know, I didn't get caught up in it. If I I I, I won't use many critic cr- cricketing analogies, but you have to play, you have to play every ball on its individual basis, you know, and you take every day on its individual basis as well. Some days are a disaster. Get underneath the sheets. Make sure the cats are fed and just let it go. But some days when you're having fun, just, you know, and let's face it, being creative is the reason it's so addictive is because it is, it is such fun and such magic when it's happening. You just got to, you just got to grasp it. You got to grasp every, every moment of it. One thing, well, I, I hate to stay in the book, but it's so interesting to me. Um, I've got so many questions about it now in my head. No, you, you go, you, you, you go for your life. I guess the first one I want to, I really want to address is what's the book about and what's the goal with it? Uh, well, the book is about, I just, I read a lot of, um, I, I read and listen to a lot of history. Um, um, like, I, and I like, I think anybody who's, a, I consider myself a fan of history as opposed to, a a historian <laughs> uh but i'm fascinated with you know uh the roman republic uh the and uh also the mongols uh, one of our cats is called genghis even though uh, apparently the pop the proper pronunciation is genghis so remember that when you meet a real pedant in the pub <laughs> one day um and also uh nazi nazi germany i mean as as topics as much as i love fiction as complicated stories of ambition and humanity and blood and sheer wrongness you can't you can't get any more involved in that if you created those as fictional societies then it wouldn't be believable the scale of it the the twists and 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 the turns it would be it would be unsustainable as a fictional narrative um and it's set in uh, World World War Two in in Germany in in Hamburg, and it's basically the story of a a a father. Although you know, it's not to relegate his wife to a supporting role. She's she's more than that. And increasingly through the book, who uh, receives news that his son, who also who serves on a U boat, has been killed at sea, and that's that's the beginning of the story. To give anything else away about it or to say anything else about it would rather give away what one might generously term or the plot twist okay. um yeah. it's it's been very int- it's called beneath the waves and ocean after the m- after the future the left song because that's the right it's it's the right title for it that was the it was those words which set off set off the story in my head i really didn't want to write a book set in World War Two Germany, because I think we can all agree that's been fucking done. But the very particular story I had uh, w- could only have been set in Nazi Germany. If I'd created a fictional or science, fic- you know, science fiction world in order to create the the tension, the dynamic that was created, I probably would have spent 150 pages just you know, trying to draw this world out when simply the the shorthand to trying to create a a, par, a a world which evokes Nazi Germany 
um, because I have I have German friends and I'm very I'm very aware of either boring or patronizing them. You know, I don't think I'd offend them. I think you're a long a long way beyond beyond that and it's largely historically accurate though if anybody was interested in publishing the book i would you know ever or if i ever had more money than i need to simply pay rent i would like to go back to hamburg and actually map out the actual streets involved because i've there's a lot of guesswork in terms of street names by virtue of me not being not being from the place i've been to hamburg several times to play shows but like when you go to go to cities or towns to play shows you usually just see a venue a restaurant and then a cheap hotel and then you yeah. leave if you're lucky if you're lucky yeah so i if you if you're lucky yeah and okay I've, I've been very lucky in my life to certainly in the last few years by insisting i've got to do a little bit of sightseeing but certainly in my whole time of touring with McCluskey, which was, I guess, a significant amount of touring, adds up to about a year and a half of life altogether. In that time, I did two days wow. of sightseeing. Um, and that was only by insisting. And even when we toured the States, which isn't very much, 2012 was the last time. Every single time I tried to see Niagara Falls and every single time we drive past the little entrance, the little road you've got to take to Niagara Falls and we don't have time to go. And I watch it. I watch the entrance go away from me. The same applies to Alcatraz. I always see it over the, I don't think it's the Golden Gate Bridge. I think it's the other the other bridge across the bay in San Francisco. I was, I've always wanted to go to Alcatraz. And I always see it in the distance and I never actually get to go. But I use that, I use that frustration positively. So, I mean, obviously the goal is to get it published then, I presume, yeah. I, I suppose, yeah. Um, I've sent it to I sent the the first draft to some friends. Um, it's not without its problems, as you would assume. It being a uh, it being a first draft, but people were very positive about it, and um, I'm I would I was delighted with how positive there was. I think they were surprised by how much of a straight historical fiction it was. Um, I, I'm a little bit surprised by it myself, to be honest with you. The the thing I was mostly concerned with was the sense of place rather than the uh, rather than the the story. I knew I could tell the story, but I think I've really got the story. The thing which has surprised me about it uh, is that it, it 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 ended up being a love story, and I absolutely didn't intend to write a love story. <laughs> no, I re I really didn't, and it, it's it really I had no idea that I had any real knowledge of 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 love i mean i'm i'm happily married but i have my share of shit relationships in my past like like every other prick you know so it was it was nice to be told by everybody who read the book that it was really really nice and you know what even if the book never gets published that sincerely means meant meant the world to me even though i never knew i needed that validation so it's uh, it's good to know it's interesting the way the narrative takes you whenever you're writing anything. I always find like you can start with good intentions or doing one thing, but often it come it often come out completely different on the other end. You know, Ab yeah. abso absolutely, yeah. It's a it's a, a a wonderful thing. And I tell you, like since we're talking specifically about artistic processes, I tell you one thing which is very interesting to me is writing. Certainly at book level, when I did short stories, I'd maybe send them to people. They'd suggest a couple of things, but it's very easy to rationalize or to know whether a short story works because it's so short. You can you can pretty much see it. You can you can look at the entirety of it, scan it in seven minutes, can't you? You know, work out what's wrong. You can maybe look for repetition. Um, but certainly writing a novel, and I think something at about 75,000 words constitutes a novel, is at least as much of a collaborative process as writing in a band. Because, you know, once you've sent sent that first draft, which contains the essence of it to people, the way that people react to it, and you don't really notice this from just one reply, you don't notice, and I mean the positives and the negatives, you don't really notice it, but once you've got, say, four replies from people, you can really see how the thing fits together, and you can really see the the strengths, or more pertinently, the, the, the weaknesses of it. And I've I found that fascinating because you don't, even though everybody knows novelists work with editors, work with alpha and beta readers, you don't think of it as, as a collaborative process in the same way you think of being in a band as a collaborative process. Um, so, yeah, that's really, 
I wouldn't say it's blown my mind, um, but I would say it's it's at least tweaked my mind a little bit, and maybe maybe see that even if even if you know you've got the the kernel of something good, um, it isn't quite right that I would trust certain friends to be able to point out to me what what it was. Makes you feel Ab- abs- absolutely, yeah, yeah totally, totally get what you're saying yeah. with that. Um, I don't know if you've ever read anything by Raymond Carver. Um, I haven't. No. Got a short story collection called "What We Talk About" when we talk about love, and it's it's lauded for being this amazing. It's very thin. It's very very short. I think it must be less than hundred, just over hundred pages or something. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's very it's lauded for being really minimalist and having really pared back prose. Mm-hmm. Um, but that was pretty much all editor, and it's like you can actually get the uncut version now after since he's he's been dead for a while now, mm-hmm. and he, the difference is like it's massive, right? You know, and I, I don't think people realise that that's how much things can change. You know, absolutely, and I get you know it. It makes you appreciate how much the, the role of the editor works. But I'm assuming as well. I'm not at all experienced in this way. I'm I'm only experienced as a reader or a, a listener because I love audio books as well. Um, I'm only experienced in in that sense, really. But I'm guessing there are also bad editors out there. You know, in the yeah. same way, in the same way, there are some really fucking bad record producers as well. <laughs> you know, some people who have their, you know, their little, uh, the, the things they do, their little, uh, I've, sorry, I've forgotten, I've forgotten how language works. The, uh, the, you know, every producer maybe has a, has a drum sound or a way they drive all the energy out of music or the way they compress it. Um, there's, there's going to be editors who have their, their tricks as well. You know, uh, I know some people take out, do things like take out every fourth line of dialogue, for example. And wow. sometimes, sometimes it gives a, sometimes it gives, it makes the conversation sound r- r- realer in inverted commas because it makes it seem less stilted, a bit less A to B to C to D to E because yeah. conversations aren't that way. So sometimes randomizing the process can, you know, can, can help, I suppose. Um, but yeah, can't remember where we were exactly. Let's, um, I suppose, let's pivot then to to Future of the Left and and Christian Fitness. Um, okay, you've released you've released three records this year, basically, um, which is mm-hmm. impressive. Uh, I guess where I want to start with this is, did how did that come about? Writing that much music? Well, just because there's there's time and it's and it's easy. And to be honest with you, I've had to stop myself from doing more. Um, I when it goes well, I mean, you, I think you said earlier um, bef- when we were speaking before you started recording that you first noticed our band or that band, Future of the Left, through our second record, uh, which is called Travels with Myself yeah. and Another, totally. which is named after the Martha Gellhorn book, which is a great, which is a great, great book. Um, as in, you know, her, her uh, kind of diaries as a roving war correspondent. It's a, it's a, it's a, an excellent read if anybody has the inclination to read that. And you know, from a female war correspondent in the nineteen, you know, in the nineteen fifties, nineteen well, nineteen forties and fifties, which is which was something of the thing at the time. Um, it the way the way I look at it is um, when it's travels was a really difficult album to write, even though it's I would say in the in the grand scheme of things, it's probably overall people's favorite record. I would think it's not my favorite. I think it's got some of the strongest songs on it, but also some of the weakest. Um, I, I think it's got four of the absolutely best future, the left songs and two or three of the weakest. Um, at that time of writing, it was really difficult. It's, I think it's a 12 song album. We wrote 13 songs and it just happened that the 12 songs, which made, made it on the record, we were, we were satisfied with. Whereas at other times, certainly in the last three or four years, I, I just can't, I just can't stop the songs really. I'm, I'm doing something and I have to, I have to run off and, and record a song until two years ago, I just, you know, set up logic on, on my Mac, started recording songs at home after I, I lost my, um, I lost my job and I had a small tax rebate enough to give myself a couple of months of, of time. And I must say in part, I used that time for lions as all, as all good, as all good people must. But I, I used a lot of the rest of the time for making music. I probably made enough money from doing my first solo album to, uh, to take another three or four months to keep, to keep writing. 
Um, and that's basically how I've lived my life for the last two years. Whilst my, whilst my beautiful wife makes most of the money and I only really feel poor when I'm on a mega bus to London. Hang on a second. Let's go back for a second. You just called the Christian, you just called Christian fitness a solo project, which is possibly a state and band camp, but it is not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, I'm, I'm not consistent. You know, I, let's, let's, let's just, let's just say it was, let's just say it was ease of reference. But yeah, I just, because that was because of the associations that I have with solo albums. It's some, some guy with an acoustic guitar trying to get back at his ex-girlfriend, you know, and it's what we used to call very early on, very early on in McCleskey, my special pain music, you know. Um, and you don't get me wrong, we've all felt my special pain. This has got to be something new about it in order to shovel it down other people's throats. So it's uh, like that topic as an individual might not necessarily inspire you to create something that might be challenging to you. Is that kind of fair to say? Um, it, it's, it's, for some, but the thing is for some people it does and some people really like that, you know, that idea. I nearly said narrative and I would have had to have punched myself in the must keep the word narrative for actual narratives. Um, that is, uh, you know, that is, that should be a, uh, that should be a commonly held belief. Um, it never inspired me, but obviously it does with some people. People love that Bon Iver, uh, went into a fucking cabin and wrote a song cause some woman burnt his soup or whatever it was, you know, but some people love that, 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 that's part of the story. They need to sell the record to them. That's not that people like the music as well. I'm not, it's not my thing at all, but people like that whole, the whole package of it. They, they lose themselves to the thought of it, not just the reality of it. I, that, it, that just doesn't interest me at all. I, I couldn't give a fuck about somebody's story. I remember reading about, they're not exactly one of my favorite bands, even though I like a lot of the music, but The Clash are a really fantastic band to read about in that regard, about the, you know, the propagation of image as opposed to actual reality. And the, the, way, they, the way they sold themselves, it's really interesting. And I, I feel as if, I feel as if in, in the last, 10 to 15 years you've had a lot of bands who've explicitly gone through the clash blueprint for success on a step-by-step -step basis even to the point of uh uh with mick jones saying that the libertines were the best band in the world or some some stuff which is you know such so agree so egregiously wrong it's amazing the world didn't stop fucking spinning at that precise moment I totally agree with that. Like a hundred percent, that band are just not for me. Well, they're, they're not. They're not for me. And a band not being for you. Let's face it. That's that's everyday practice. I, I resent. I resent something being sold to me as being important by people who should know better. You know, when people tell me that they like the Libertines, I usually just think you're scared of being lonely, mate. <laughs> and you know what that is entirely that is entirely my own prejudices coming through um but fuck me i'll stand by those prejudices and i'll i will fight for them to the fucking death <laughs> well i know i know you're reluctant to use the word but i actually think narrative is a correct word for that because that's kind of what we're sold these days with music like we're given this narrative and you're kind of told by somebody in a magazine or whatever that you need to like this music because of this reason, this reason, this reason, and that's the way it's going to be, you know? Uh, it seems to be the way music is going now, you know? I've been doing this podcast for a wee while and I've been involved in some kind of music journalism for so long that every single day I get a new narrative land in my inbox and I'm just kind of like, can you just give me a record so I can just listen to that instead of having to tell me the whole band's maybe real, maybe not life story? No, you, re you really can't though. And, you know, in, in part... In part, I understand it. Um, I understand. I understand it's very difficult to write about notes, you know, in a way which is engaging for an audience. Uh, you're talking about as a music journalist. You're talking about translating the, you know, you're talking about translating the excitement of the music somehow into print. Talking for a, a general audience about how the music plays off against each other isn't going to excite them in the same way that stories about if we may take our last case, people stealing from each other, people, uh, you know, having overdoses, people getting their, 
their bouncers to, you know, their bodyguards to allegedly kill people for them, et cetera, et cetera, is far more exciting than Andrew and Jack had a nice day and wrote a song, you know? So I understand it on that level. doesn't make it any less fucking sad. And it doesn't, I mean, you know, there are some bands who seemingly just to have different relationships or have people die around them every single record. So in order they can give it something to hang it off. And and no, that's not me being completely cynical because when that's part of their marketing campaign, my cynicism isn't even really called into it, is it? I'm, I'm being asked to directly, to directly relate to that. There's the argument, I suppose, that it can help people going through similar things in a way. But, you know, if you need, if you need help from musicians, then <laughs> I suppose, yeah, you fucking need help. Do you think that speaks to this kind of argument for authenticity then that somehow, you know, that we now that we know this band have done some shit and have had a life that their music is somehow more authentic? To to a degree, yeah. It's it's a dangerous word, authenticity, because it, you know, because because you're really into that 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 proper music uh debate, which is which is quite it is quite the thing. It really brings the twats out of the woodwork on both on both sides, you know. Uh the whether that's let's face it, it's usually guys in their forties. Uh guys in their forties on one side, you know, talking about you know, listen to the charlatans, mate, it's real music, or people on or guys in their forties who are overcompensating in another way who think that, you know, it's unfathomable that one of their peers wouldn't like Taylor Swift. Um or, or I, none of those people are my friends. I will say that these are these are people who wear their tastes as badges <laughs> rather than rather than as actual tastes, which is where they're meant to be worn around the heart. So one thing that makes me wonder then is your music's quite antagonistic, which is what I like about it, but it's also kind of not. Mm. <laughs> if that makes any sense. <laughs> ah, okay, wait, where are you going with this? <laughs> it's like there's always a. It's often quite twisted, but there's always like a pop sensibility underneath it, you know? Always, yeah. It's like I remember when I first heard uh, Travels With Myself and Another, and I was like, whoa, that's really weird. I don't know if I want to listen to that again, but mm. I kind of do as well. <laughs> and then when I did, I obviously really enjoyed it. And it seems to me that when I listen to your music, I kind of get this sense that this is like my interpretation on pop music. It's not weirdness for weird sake it's just the way i interpret it it's just the way i interpret pop music yeah. is that like a good way of describing your music to you <laughs> it, it's it's meant it's just meant to be loud pop music um i mean pop is very much you know people associates manager back when we had one of those antiquated things um bandmates laugh sometimes when i go no this one's a pop song and they go in what sense is it a pop song i'm like because it's melody based it's based around a melody. That's what the song, you know, that that's what dominates the song. That's what that's what limits its focus or exaggerates its focus. Um, noise rock, most of the bands I like would be called post-punk or noise rock, but I just don't think we're one of those bands, even though we have elements of those bands. Something like the Jesus Lizard, for example, they, they, they don't write pop songs. It's uh, like collages of, of noise with a psychopath yelping in the background. That's... That's what it is. It's, don't get me wrong. It's 100,000 times better than that sounds. Uh, but that's that's what it is. Most of our songs are verse, chorus, verse, chorus, but hopefully presented in a way which doesn't immediately call attention to that. Um, uh, and it's a challenge sometimes to write a bit of music, a riff, if you want to sound like I'm talking to you from 1983, um, which is is odd, but you can still – get a, 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 a an amazing melody out of that's a that's a, a a real challenge and that's the kind of challenge which is which is fun i've been in bands with people uh especially in mccluskey john chapel the bass player very talented musician but he he was i i feel as though he was scared of choruses at the time he was scared of the thought of selling out you know, how that would be perceived. Um, and so if there was ever a chorus, he'd kind of do his best, I feel, to undermine that. Um, I, I I don't take that approach. I, I simply write write the song which comes to you, you know. Um, that doesn't work for everybody, I understand, particularly younger bands, but we were definitely at a stage where we were hitting our stride and uh, – the songs just just happened, and to really to apply any editor, editorializing to it, 
would would to be do it an injustice when something needs to be loud and nasty it should speak of that itself and it's almost as if you know i am i am a good few few thousand kilometers removed from being a hippie but songs in rehearsals in a, in a, in that unit in those magical moments and i'm sure you know this as well being in a band when it happens you don't no nobody's really shaping it consciously are no, they no not at all it, it just it just takes you into another it takes you into another direction um whereas and again similarly i've been in, in bands with people who you can tell want stuff to be want stuff to be successful they're consciously writing in a particular direction for me both of those approaches don't do the, don't do the music any favors so where does that come from in you where did that pop sensibility begin I have no idea. I I really don't. I just I love doing what I do, but also I know I've got to to stand by it as well. Maybe it was because I didn't release a record till I was twenty five years old, having wanted to for years. And the first one is, if we can use the you know correct jargon, <laughs> dog shit. <laughs> um, but it, it really it was a collection of demos, and it, it shouldn't have even have been released. McCluskey do Dallas should have been the first record. Um, but um, you, you realise really early on that those those songs are there forever, and you've got to you've got to stand beside them. And you know, one of my one of my character flaws is I'm quite a proud person, and I can you know there's there's a, a few songs over the course of the the you know the putting out music that I I'm not proud of now, but um you know they were they were created and released with the best intentions and in good faith. So. So if they don't work, then they don't work. I know I I never deliberately wrote a single or deliberately cloaked a single in noise, you know. I can listen back to certain songs now and think, that's a little bit smooth for my liking or uh, that song doesn't quite work for me. The, the biggest regrets, though, are songs which, for me, are really, are really good songs, have great bits, but I didn't put in that little bit of extra effort, which I know I could have put in, to make them great songs. There's about three songs over the, uh, I nearly said catalog, three songs over the fucking catalog, um, which uh, uh, I'm, I, I think that is probably, probably the case, but I'm not too disappointed in myself because sometimes, sometimes you're lazy. I mean, this may seem like an odd question, but do you think it's like that sense of pride that's kind of kept you, you know, sticking in at it and doing it for so long? Possibly, or, or it could be just a myopic vision of fuck all, um, which which has consumed me. There are a lot of good people I know who have been in bands who uh, say they get dropped, dropped by the record label, which happened to us with Beggars, which wasn't even a blessing in disguise for us. So uh, so poorly had they behaved for uh, for years, um, but. They, they, you know, they, 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 there's a lack of interest in the band. Maybe their crowds dwindle and they just give up on being in a band. And I understand that. And I have those feelings myself. Um, probably twice a year I play a show, which is either really badly attended or uh, really badly, or we're just treated really badly or the venue's terrible. I mean, you know, I'm a, I'm a singer for want of a better term. I need, I need good monitoring the way I sing. Otherwise I lose my voice if I'm touring and I have to be incredibly conscious of, of that fact. It's one of the reasons I didn't want to do this uh, interview in person is a, because the, the day of a show, especially when we've traveled up to Glasgow is very busy, but also because I can't talk this much before a show much to my, bandmates relief um <laughs> but it um yeah it they, they've given up on on music and in some cases you, you can see why it happened life happened to them kids in some cases uh just being sick of being broke in other cases um i know some people with chips on their shoulders the fact they weren't in bigger bands and you know what if I let myself, if I let myself sink into that, I'd I'd agree with them. They'd be they'd be they'd be totally correct to think that way. But unfortunately, that doesn't get you anywhere. And you know, they, as any of us who've lived lived life can see, looking around, the, the people you remember, the people who make an impression, are the people who just carry on, regardless 
because life carries on regardless. We've lost people, people die. You get up the next morning and you look out the door and everybody hasn't doesn't have a, you know, an honor guard for you, for your grief for the rest of the day. Cars still go past and the shopkeeper still wants to charge you for a double decker. You don't get free double decker because of grief. And it's really harsh. It's it's a really harsh thing, but you know, that's how that's how life works. Oh my god, I sound like um I sound like some of my Facebook friends are always posting those uh, motivational memes and things. I do, I do, I do apologise. <laughs> oh, well, you know, I think I think you're quite right. I've noticed it myself. You know, there's a lot of younger bands out there that will maybe try and think they can game the system, as if that can still somehow make things easier without actually realising, like, no, you have to eat shit for a long, long time in order to be a band with success, you know? And going down that road means that you're probably going to want to give in at some point, you know? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So it's actually really nice to hear you say that in a weird way because McCluskey and Future Left are really well-known bands and to hear that sometimes you think, oh, fuck, I just want to give in. It's kind of nice, you know, in a weird way. It's kind of nice in a weird way, which is odd to say, I guess. It's just heartening to know that you also get bad days and that that's important to know. Uh, ab- absolutely. I mean, we, we feel... I mean, it, everything's relative, you know. Um, it, it's absolutely relative. If I look at the way that uh, you, the friends I have in bands who are quite big bands, and of course, of course, I think the music I make is the best. That's because I make it. <laughs> um, and it, I would hope that everybody, say, listening to this is in a band, thinks the same way about their band. You've, you've got to really, or rather you've got to, I think, if you want to do anything really good. That I'm not saying that that's a mindset that everybody needs, but it's certainly the kind of thing that motivates me. I've been very lucky in my life to play uh, with some of my favourite bands, the the, uh, the Fall, uh, Wire, Shellac, Mission of Burma particularly. Um, and Every single time I've gone on stage with those bands, I've wanted to blow them clean off the fucking stage. You want to go on stage and you want to make them feel as if, oh, we can't follow that. I'm not saying that happened. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm not saying that happened, but that's the motivation behind it because that's what rock and roll should be. It shouldn't be politely contributing to an evening of, uh, of a huge love-in. Rock and roll yeah, it's a, it should be a brutal, a brutal assault on the senses, you know, in in all kinds of ways. And it should you want people to leave feeling as if they've had one of the most exhilarate, exhilarating nights of their life. And I know anecdotally, some people have felt like that, and some people haven't <laughs> felt like that. It would be uh, it would be simplest to say. So is it kind of like because you experienced that in the past that you wanted to do that, but you wanted to do that better? To a degree, yeah. I mean, for me with music, the reason um, it was music I kind of chose to not specialise in makes it sound as if I had all these fucking options that I'd uh, been been beamed down from the planet private school and I was simply deciding which, you know, which lucky which lucky form of expression should have the delight of my talents. The reason is I, I, I specifically remember going to the Redden Festival um, with my brother when I was... 16 or was I 17 I don't know I was a teenager and I remember watching all the bands and obviously festivals aren't the best way to see bands because there's anybody who's been to festivals knows it's largely the snare drum and vocal mix um for every single band I mean who would have thought that shoveling loads of bands through a stage like a production line would result in really similar sounding shitty bands. Um, I watched <laughs> yeah. all these bands over the Reading weekend, and with the exception of a couple who had a, something of a spirit, usually the ones who looked a little bit fucking embarrassed to be there, I must be said. Um, I thought I can do better than this. This isn't. This just isn't that good. Whereas, say, I had an interest in comedy when I was younger, and I'd always read or see comedies, which made me think. I'm not sure I could do any better than that. I think that's good. I think I could contribute. I think I could, I could be there or thereabouts with something I could write. But certainly at the time, I didn't feel as if I would be adding anything to the ongoing conversation. Um, and so that's why I suppose I moved towards music. Aside from I do have a 
my, my father, who is no longer with us, and, and my mother, who, who is, they were both um, primary school music teachers. Um, and for years I fought, I think, on a subconscious level not to like music, even when, you know, they forced me to play the violin. Um, I did a thing called the Suzuki Method, which is um, entirely by ear, so I never learned to, to read music or anything. Um, so I... I think that that love of me of music was always in me, although I didn't really let it out till sixteen. Before that time, I was determined to be a an international cricketer, but that didn't that didn't quite work out for me. So, what kind of bands was it that you kind of heard that you heard the records and you kind of thought, "I really want to do that, but better." Um. Well, it would be you know when I was a. I loved Queen when I was young. I had passing flirtations, you know, being a teenager with Guns N' Roses or whatever when I was 13. And that's allowed. It's called puberty. Um, but then, you know, you, well, certainly I moved past that. I was really into metal for a bit, but um, I don't know, got got bored with metal quite quickly. And it's, to me, this, this some metal is fantastic, but uh, for, for music, which prides itself on being really heavy, I just don't find it very heavy. You know, there's something there's something quite clicky and comical about it to me. Although maybe that's maybe that's the point. And I know it's a cliche to say it, but when you've got rain and blood, I I just you know I I have I've never heard any other any other metal which interests me in a in a way which gets me to investigate beyond that. I could be totally wrong. Maybe it could be just the uh, the things I've been given, or the things to listen to, or the things I've happened upon. Um, and then there was Nevermind came out when I was 16. I, I loved it at the time. Uh, I, I suppose it's, it's, it's flo- relative flaws as an album weren't apparent to a 16 year old. Um, you know, it's, it's cleanliness, it's smoothness. And the fact that really about five of the songs are completely interchangeable. Um, I mean, you look at a song like Come As You Are or In Bloom or I uh, uh, forget what the other one is, which is this exactly the same song. But you could basically just move the parts of those songs around into each other without any, without really, without any uh, problems. You might have to shift a key here or there. I don't say that as a huge criticism. It's obviously a, a classic record, whatever the fuck that means. But a record like In Utero, which came out a couple of years later, just has just has more of a soul. Um, and uh, from then on, it was, you know, discovering bands like Huskadoo, Gang of Four, The Clash. I was into, by the time I got to college in Cardiff when I was 18, I was listening to, it's it's still an embarrassing to think, thing to say as a man in his early 40s, but, you know, a lot of, a lot of hip-hop, particularly Public Enemy, um, before, frankly, the, the lyrical concerns of hip-hop became for me at the time just too ridiculous and repetitive to to even concern yourself with um and i think you can well a lot of people who who know me have can find my love of hip hop sometimes in the in the rhythms i use in songs I'm not not rapping perish the thought that would be an that would be an embarrassing moment for all concerned <laughs> but uh it it is something you know it is still something which sits there deep in the uh you know, deep in deep in your consciousness, waiting to come out in a in a, in a song. Um, but yeah, there wasn't. I I always liked bands, but I never never hero worship bands. I've always been a little bit not amused, interested when I've seen people people I've been in bands with meet their heroes. Um, it's it's interesting. They they go they go to pieces. Um, it's it's very it's very sweet. I'm I'm I can be a little bit a little bit cautious meeting people for the first time um but I'm I'm not like that and maybe that's why and there are people I've been in bands with who are definitely fans in the sense that they'll hear a new band um and immediately for the next 2 or 3 months everything they write sounds exactly like that band um what was what we called in uh, McCluskey, uh, the smog phase for a while. Uh-huh. Uh, I'd say, oh, it's another song which sounds like smog. That's interesting. You know? <laughs> Tell me, which part of Massachusetts are you from? Um, but of course, that's just me being a horrible human being. But um, 
yeah, I, whereas I've, again, having been involved in writing songs for a long time, I know that if I hear a band I like, I'll kind of need to process that influence for a while. Anything I write, which even invokes it for the next year, it'll just be, it'll just be ripping it off. But then you'll find maybe two and a half years having heard a, a band you quite like, you've managed to, I've usually found a way to incorporate that, that genuine like, I wouldn't necessarily go, go as far as love. I, I, I don't give love easily. You find a way to incorporate that band you like into your music in a way which isn't just transparently ripping it off. So it's filtered it through the lens of Falco, basically. You felt you well. You filter, filter it through a lens of just time, self knowledge, and hopefully self respect. I think you know. Um, we all know. I mean, I've, you know, I've written several songs which are, it, to all effect, Pixies covers with a different person singing. Um, but you know, you you move on from that. Um, you move on from that, hopefully, and then you become. For better or worse, you become y- yourself with your with your respectful of other people's opinions, even when they're obviously wrong. But just uh, you know, just doing what it is that you do. The most interesting artists to me um, are the people who are themselves. Not even going as far as unashamedly themselves, because if you're unashamedly yourself, it rather rather implies you've got something to prove. Um, and are, and are being a bit of, of a dick about it as you're doing it, but um, I, yeah, just just that, just that way of projecting, just that way of projecting a, a, a sense, not necessarily of yourself. It's not that it's not that direct. It's just something which is right. We never, you know, we never have to sit down to have a conversation. Is this song title a bit too long? What about this song? Does it work? Usually if you're having that conversation, it means there's a problem. And we've never kind of sat down to come up with an idea for a record or we've never had to have a conversation about, should this be the lead song or should this not you know, be the lead song? These things are very lucky by the nature of what I, because of what we do. Um, and it's definitely not to... I think what is an important thing, I mean, you're in a band, like we were speaking about the collaborative process, is the people you collaborate with, even if you lead that band or whatever, obviously you lead a novel if you write it, the way that they filter things, the speed of their reactions is it's it's integral to the process as well. I think that's true. And it's the same as when bands replace members as well. You know, there's always something slightly different about it. You can't really quite put your finger on it. Even if they're playing, even if they're playing the same music, it still somehow sounds a little bit different, you know. I mean, again, maybe it's maybe that's a call back to what we were saying. Narrative. Maybe there is no difference, but we know we know that there is because the the people involved, the, the you know the people involved, the people who've put their sweat and tears into that, the people who've given you that look when you've come up with that part, uh, the people who've shaped it with the way they've played that bass line or that drum beat. I mean, I'm very lucky. Um, I'm very lucky that uh, the certainly the people I'm in a, a band with have been in a band with, or very creative people, um, and for the most part, play without ego. Uh, Julia is a very creative person. Jack is, as a drummer, Jack is, you know, exceptional. As a, as a bass player, Julia is exceptional as well. But Jack is a really exceptional listener. And over the years, Julia's got a lot better at that as well. It's the key, it's the key thing for a musician, in my opinion, is the ability to is the ability to listen and the lack of ego to say it doesn't matter if my instrument gets turned down if that's what the song needs. Uh, and also, and also, the just the fundamental understanding, certainly when it comes to the kind of rock music we make, the fundamental understanding, and this to be a touchstone of everything. Less is more. Great riff, always begin by taking, let's listen to that riff again, take out two notes. Another thing we do as well, which is a kind of policy, um, unless unless everything isn't working, is never, never find out what key somebody is playing in. Because if you know what key they're playing in, then you're probably going to play what would be expected, what anybody would play to go along with that. Just simply put your hands on your fretboard or your, your whatever, and don't be scared to make a mistake. 
That's how, see, Christian Fitness, the, my non-solo solo record, it's all written. It's all written at home. So it has a, it's usually written at about one in the morning after I've gone for a run. I've usually had a beer or two and this, the music just comes out in a big soup of whatever the hell happens. Feature the Left is written loudly in a rehearsal room and it's all about the interplay between the, the relative musicians. And it's it's all about trusting each other. Um, it's all about knowing that my my point in the process is I'm usually right when it comes to ideas, other people's ideas, but I'm not always right. And sometimes I'm very wrong. Um, and you've got to be in a band with people who trust you that when you say it's right, you probably are right. But when similarly, it's that that's the careful balance. When you are wrong, they've got to have the confidence to go, Nah, you're talking tits, mate. Totally agree with what you're saying there, because like yeah, in our band, like it's taken me a really long time. I mean, I'm 31 now, but it's taken me quite a long time to get into a band where the uh, the entire songwriting process is democratic. You know, we always have this attitude that the song is king, so it's like whatever the song needs, the song gets. And you'd be amazed. I mean, you even know yourself. You know, you all you all know yourself that people tend to overplay all the time when they're in bands. They do, they do. But it takes a really, it takes. It takes time and it takes maturity to underplay. It really, it really does. It takes, um, and I don't mean maturity, you know, in the sense of graying hair and a glass of perno after some uh, linguini. I mean, in the sense of it takes real, it takes real perspective and it takes, it takes listening properly. L- listening, listen before you play, you know, listen before you play what, what is happening and, just other tricks as well. People ask me for songwriting advice. I say all the time, probably twice a week. My first bit of songwriting advice is buy a fucking tuner pedal yeah? <laughs> and never tune up in between songs audibly. You could, you may as well just scream amateur in the microphone. Um, keep the song gaps down unless you've got something funny to say. And secondly, in terms of actual songwriting, is to try try starting. Somebody's got a bit of music. Don't approach it. Don't approach it in a straight way. Um, try, try, try playing your part from the second note or halfway through. Uh, it's a good, it's a good way to to just begin. Um, like I say, I wouldn't have even been able to formalize that thought until I really learned to formalize my study of writing in the last two years. Um, it's been, it's only been learning to to write right, which has made made me look at those, look at those unconscious processes I've, I've had for for writing music and yeah it's been it's been really good apart from you know at times making me feel as though I am I am a psychotic I think I think being able to articulate that knowledge is very valuable of that's knowledge that you want to pass on you know there's a lot of songwriters out there that won't necessarily mm. be interested in wanting to share that 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 with other people you know no no they're not um I, I think it's you know anytime somebody's Anytime somebody's interested and they're uh, amazing. The only questions I get a bit tired of asking, answering are questions about guitar tunings. Guitar tunings, you know, just just play a guitar. And if it goes out of tune and it sounds cool, just play it and then write something and then just write down what the tuning is. Uh, oh, although don't do that all the time because we don't all, all have the time, uh, money and space for nine different guitar tunings. Or nine different guitars. Oh, insane. And you don't want to be changing your tunings on stage unless, you know, unless you want to become a hate figure for an entire audience. Maybe that's the plan. Maybe it's, yeah, you know, a kind of, uh, you know, deliberately annoying music where you're meant to hate the band. Well, Andy, I've had a really good, I've had a really good time talking to you. It's been really great. Um, before I did this interview, I asked my personal Facebook page if anybody had any questions. So I'm just going to ask a few of those questions. Okay. If that's cool. Of course, of course. So the first question is, what the hell are you talking about lyrically and where do you get your lyrical style from? <laughs> what am I talking about? Well, like a, a lot of the best songs for me or the best, the, I suppose, to my personal taste as well as the way we perform songs, are the songs which are about something which without necessarily going on about that thing too much. 
Um, that that would be as succinctly as I could frame it. I think it, it does work. The more extreme example would be something like off our third record, there's a song called Robocop 4, Fuck Off Robocop, which is about just film franchises. It takes some people, um, uh, idiots, I'd venture, who you know, have messaged me to say, what's your problem with action films, mate? Um, which is, isn't so much missing the point as being fucked in the eye by it. But um, <laughs> there is, you know, and, you know, some of the songs, though, are just just language, just language falling into each other. Um, and I suppose in the same way that we were talking about musical influences, the way they gradually get taken on board and then uh, di- you know, distributed in a way you don't, instantly instantly realize it's the same lyrically as well you you read about things you experience things in the world uh you read books you listen to conversations and then it just all comes out at the right time um and lyrically with the odd exception how are the lyrics written we're in the studio there'll be i'll have a line or two 10 minutes before i'm doing the vocal i'll just sit down and scribble down some words and then I'll do a vocal take and it's either great or uh, in, <laughs> relatively uh, one more time um, uh, or it's not so good. And I listen back and go, oh, I need to change that word and that word. Because for me, if a word's wrong, it, it, it sounds wrong. Um, but uh, it's, th- there's a thread of, there's a thread of meaning, which is, which is contained there in the subconscious, but you don't, you don't, you don't sit down and go, I'm going to write a song about how racism is bad. Because frankly, for our audience, we know racism is bad. And we're not so much preaching to the converted, you know, as, well, that's exactly what we're doing. I don't even, I can't even continue that thread. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, that's 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 exactly, you know, that's that's the whole process. There's, I suppose, like like in songwriting, the work is done before you do the work in the same way that with songwriting, when it's not going well, uh, it's important to remember when you're in a rehearsal or when you're writing, you're still doing good work, even if that doesn't make its way directly to the page or directly to a record. You're still putting in those hours. You're still churning stuff over. And, you know, there'll be a time you'll be in a rehearsal or whatever, three months later, and that weird little melody you came up with that day, you had this shit practice comes up and shows its head again and, makes that song you're working on that day better. Um, and it's it's important to to keep that perspective. And it's the same way I know if I listen to a, a lot of audio books, a lot of podcasts, I read books, uh, I know if I'm doing anything of worth, that'll end up seeping into the seeping into the material. You know, one thing I've always had whenever I've seen your lyrics or heard your lyrics is a lot of reviewers pick up on the obvious things like you know, they're very witty or angry or funny. And they are, of course, all those things. But also to me, it kind of is also like someone that really appreciates language and likes to play with it, you know. So you've got all those anachronisms and, you know, kind of playing with words in really weird and interesting ways. Mm-hmm. You know, these kind of things that make it unique in a very specific kind of future to the left, McCluskey kind of way, you know. I don't know if I've articulated that properly, but... Yeah. Well, I, th- I think to be honest with you, I, I know what you're saying, and I, I I take that compliment, and I feel it's you know somewhat deserved. But I think more than that, it's a bit of an indictment about the way most people write lyrics. Uh, when most people write lyrics, they uh, especially bands you actually get to hear, they fall so strictly into a a paradigm of rock lyrics. And you're talking about intelligent people for the most part. You're talking about uh, well-read people. You're talking about uh, politically motivated people. Uh, but when it comes to rock lyrics, it becomes, you know, it's either about girls or, or boys or, or society, you know? <laughs> and it, it, it becomes a little bit much. It's, you know, nu- nuances are, I mean, it, it might sound a bit rich coming from a guy who spends half his time shouting and playing a detuned guitar to speak about nuance but you know it's it's fucking there you know in our music nuance i'm a big believer in i said this in an interview the other day so uh, i apologize for repeating myself i think one of the one of the best worst illustrations of current internet discourse is people posting something on twitter or whatever with the with the accompanying nailed it now, for me, it's difficult 
it's difficult on a regular basis to nail what are complex situations. I think at the best, you can add to the conversation, you know. Um, you know, you'll read articles like, here is why people are voting for Donald Trump. And people say, nailed it. You go, no, you know, that's useful. That's a resource. I, I get that. that. Some of that's true, but it is not. It is not the end. It is not the empirical truth. I mean, the same extends to issues of social justice, um, as it's called now, which tend to be, no pun intended, very black and white in some people's eyes, which I think stops those things developing in a, in a way which benefits everybody. But of course, I'm not alone in thinking that. I'm, I, I don't. I don't think I'm bringing you the news in any regard. You know, Twitter's got a way of kind of compressing discourse into something which is almost meaningless. You know, and I fucking hate that. Uh, well, it. I mean, you know, it. It is mobilised and given uh, some. Uh, I don't know if it's given power to people, but it's given an impression of power to people who were previously. Oh God, oh God, I think you've got to pay a fine for using this word these days, disenfranchised um, in, in all kinds of ways, from from people on the left uh, to people on on the right, both sides of it. I'd, I'd be much more inclined to, to those people on the left, you know, those people who, you know, before where would a, where would a disabled person make their voice heard in a in a public discourse? You know, um, how would they how would they even get themselves to to the stage in order to make their voice heard? But similarly, you get the people on the right who I'm le- I'm less ne- naturally inclined towards, to say the fucking least. But being a human being mandates that you should at least make a fucking effort to see why they're an idiot. You know, as you know, you should at least try and 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 work out why they're a fucking idiot, as opposed to just thinking it occurs in a vacuum because it doesn't. Another funny-ish one, I guess, is are there any sideburns in pop culture that you particularly admire? No, I just I just grew sideburns to hide my massive fat hamster cheeks. It just that's that's the way that's the way it went there when they were big and bushy, which was around about the start of Future the Left. I did on about. 94 occasions have kids like lean out of buses and shout Wolverine at me, which was, um, I don't know if that was a good or a bad thing. I was accused of being prideful about it. Uh, that wasn't the case. It was more just bewildering. Um, but yeah, in, in time they got, in time they got trimmed down and I look like less of a hedge. Another question, which I guess is somewhat related to that, is somebody wanted to know why you cut your hair because apparently you looked really handsome when the first Future of the Left record came out. <laughs> well, just despite the person who asked that question, that's the answer. I don't, I don't like to, uh, I don't like to be considered attractive by anybody. Okay, this next one is uh, you need to answer right off the top of your head uh, with the first two things that come in your head. Okay, so first is. Top two favorite books at the moment. Top two favorite books at the minute. Well, uh, my well, he's he's now a friend because we used um, an, an epigram, a future left epigram in the song uh, in his book, A Head Full of Ghosts. It was a guy called Paul Tremblay, but uh, he subsequently written another book, which has been released over here called uh, Disappearance at Devil's Rock, which for me is even even better. Um, Head Full of Ghosts, which has had a lot of attention. I know Stephen King tweeted about it very enthusiastically, uh, but you, it's it's really good. It's it's kind of a modern reimagining of The Exorcist. Uh, but I'm not really a I'm not really a horror guy as such. So for me, a lot of the references slip slip by me. Whereas the second book, uh, Disappearance at Devil's Rock, it just registered more with me. I can imagine oddly it being a less successful book, it having less of a general reach. Uh, but I think it's it's no less better for that. And I'm at this moment in time, I'm re-listening to um, American Tabloid by James Elroy, uh, which sorry, I'm doing a lot of up talk there. That's a bit that's a bit odd. Maybe I maybe I need a nap. Um, I'm not a huge fan of up talking in general. Uh, American Tabloid by by James Elroy, which um, which is which is which is great. I mean it's. It's it's you, you you know uniquely written and deliberately uniquely written, which sometimes gets on my tits a bit. Um, I, I read it when I was a, when I was a kid and, and enjoyed it, but probably didn't appreciate it as much as much as I'm appreciating it now. The only Elroy that I've read is Ellie Confidential. 
Oh, it's 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 LA Confidential is great. American Tabloid has a has a bigger sweep. Uh, it it has a it has a bigger sweep to the story. You know, a lot of the a lot of the, the I mean, being uh, being based around the, you know the Kennedys and J Edgar Hoover, and so it has uh, a lot of fictionalized versions of very famous people. Um, but it does it it does it very well in in a way which in a way which doesn't seem crass and tokenistic. It's not like some shitty book where somebody, you know, writes Hitler as a bad man who comes in the room and shouts things. You know, it's not it's not quite that basic. But it's it, it really is it's it's fantastic. It's it's a little bit exhausting because because so much there's so little waste in Elroy's writing that uh so so much happens. There's very little time for reflection. So when the reflection does happen, it's it's a bit of a blessed relief. But yeah, it's superb. That's why I like Raymond Chandler actually for the same sort of thing. You know that that sparseness. Yeah, I've, uh, obviously with Elroy, uh, you know, I've had I've had uh, like Chandler recommended to me a lot. I, I think I even have a book of his in my in my pile waiting to read, but. Uh, but I I can't buy any more books that I haven't read. It'll get it'll get ridiculous. I'm in danger of. There was a, a lyric in a McCluskey song called "See Them, Smell Them, Sign Them," which was uh, used uh, as a on the McCluskeyism, uh, like the compilation we did at the end of the band. And there was uh, there was a lyric in that song: "Pretend that those books on your wall have been read when really they're keeping you warm. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm, if I buy any more books, I'm in, I'm in danger of becoming that person I was slagging off uh, 12 years ago. So I'm desperately trying not to become that person. Uh, that's dangerous territory for sure. Yeah, yeah. Nothing nothing sexier than hypocrisy. One person wanted to let you know that they got the fuzz pedal off of Pledge Music and they thought it was fantastic. Ex- ex- well, that is... You know that's that's all I need to hear there. That's great. And the guy who makes it, um, uh, Frederick Effects, uh, he does the the. It's, it's half based on his uh, like Big Muff clone. This is just for guitarists. This part of the conversation, and it's fantastic. I know so many so many people who use that who use that pedal almost exclusively. It's for for that that bass sound. It's oh, it's it's a superb superb thing. I'm not really a uh, a gear guy. Um, I'd quite happily just walk on the stage and have somebody put a guitar into my hands and just start yelling. But even that, even with that perspective, you know when something is a special bit of kit. Well, I love gear, and I'm actually looking for a new fuzz pedal just now, so I'll need to check him out. Honestly, it's it's fan- it's really it's really fantastic. It's the uh, oh God, I, I I could I could email you. Uh, I can't remember what it's actually called, but it, it is basically the because. Again, this is going to bore anybody who doesn't play guitar, but the problem with the classic big muffs is you usually have to dial the sound into them so precisely they're either incredibly muddy or far too toppy. With this pedal, it's just so much. It's a it's an absolute pleasure. So one for the uh, one for when you've got a spare eighty eight quid there. Well, I've had a really good time talking to you, so thank you very much for taking time out your day to do that. Oh, it's, 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 yeah, same here, my friend. Same here. Uh, is there anything else you want to say, or anything you want to ask me before we finish? Uh, I, I've been talking about myself for an hour and twenty minutes, so I'm on a, I'm on a little bit of a high. So I'm, uh, I can't really, I can't really think of anything else to say. No, I'll, you know, just the advice you have got to give everybody in this world: um, cheap bin bags are a false economy. <laughs> well, thank you very much for talking to me, Andy. I appreciate it. See you later. No problem. Take care. Well, we got there in the end, didn't we? had a really good time talking to Andy, he's a total gentleman and I really fucking love Future Ever Left. I hope after listening to that, that you do too. The new Future Ever Left album, The Peace and Truth of Future Ever Left, is out now. You can get that on their website. If you haven't already, please take a second to subscribe to this podcast. You can do that by hitting the subscribe button in whatever app you're using right now. And if you could like and share this with your friends, that'd be really good because that helps more people listen to this podcast and I would love it if more people listen to this podcast. Thank you very much for listening. Until next time. Bye-bye.